Good morning, everyone. It is truly an honor to join you here today in Stockholm. Um, I come from the edge, I come from Kenya, and as I was talking to one of the speakers who uh, is coming up, uh, we were just comparing notes about how the internet can lead into non-linear lives. I'm the child of a former architect um, and a school teacher, and I was working in the US before I got together with a few friends and together I'll share a few stories and a few of the things that I've learned from some of the things that we built. I was working as a computer scientist um, for Sprint Telecom. So the story of the internet uh, is quite uh, close to my heart and it was really fun to hear the, the song beginning, uh, wild, 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 that was really cool. Anyway, let's begin. Um, I want to talk to you today about the internet of possibility. Um, when I first got on the internet, it was a place of, yes, possibility. And I'd like to share a few of those stories. And one of the key things that came out of it is we realized that the internet was super useful when faced with adversity. So let me take you back to 2008 in Kenya a country that had been on a growth trajectory. It was doing great. There was a lot of excitement about multi-party politics, about the advent of democracy after many years of autocratic rule. And um, the elections did not go as well as we had expected. Does that sound familiar? Um, now, the problem that we had at that particular time was a a flow of information, the flow of information was curtailed. On the 29th of December 2007, there was a ban on live media broadcasts. And if there was ever a time when you wanted blanket coverage of what was happening to your country, it was then. But they were showing the sound of music. Um, and um, it led to uh, a few of us uh, collaborating, coming together and creating the first prototype of something that we called Ushahidi. Ushahidi stands for, uh, is the Swahili word for witness or testimony. And I'll show you a quick video of what we did a few years after. Ushahidi is the Swahili word for witness or testimony. Ushahidi, the software, allows for people to share their story. Our mantra revolves around three things. The crowd, uh, verification, and response. Ushahidi is free and open source. Anybody can go to the web and download it and run their own platform tomorrow. It's that simple. It allows a citizen to report to indicate, hey, this is what's going on. The underlying thing is they can use whichever device they have in their pocket and all that information is brought into a central location and mapped, so what we call geolocation. The big mission that we're on, it's really to change the way information flows in the world, to give ordinary people a voice. Ushahidi came about after the post-election violence in Kenya in early 2008. The election went south, the media houses were shut down. During that time, we started to see reports of violence. That just gives you a quick view. And um, one of the things that we learned from this experience, um, more of that, the video is available on YouTube. You can check it out later. And one of the things we learned is that, um, that I'd like to share with you is to fall back in love with problems. Um, to be guided by function when designing. Um, some of these questions about what guides you as you design the platforms that you design and what values you embed in your companies have become a little bit more pro, um, uh, top of mind in the last few weeks. The questions of what guides you, what makes, what choices do you make or what what um, values are you baking into the algorithm that, of the companies that you build? Um, just from our experience, think about the problems that you're solving and use um, function to drive the technology. It was really about problem solving here. It wasn't about, uh, oh, we have 
the greatest technology. At that time, it really wasn't. It was very simple technology. It was neither high tech nor low tech. We used simple mobile phones and a simple mashup to put it, everything together. It's really how you end up working with other people to make it all solve a problem. Now, what if the platform could be open source and available for all, all other kinds of uses? And uh, in 2009, we made it open source, and it was useful in Japan uh, and also in Haiti. I'll tell you a quick story about Japan. I didn't realize the power of the web until, well, I knew the web was powerful. But when the Japan earthquake happened, our friends at Amazon Japan and a few other, uh, OpenStreetMap Japan and other friends who were asking, you know, who, we, we were asking them, how can we help you? And they said, look, we need two things translated into Japanese. We need the manual for how to run Ushahidi translated, and we also need the platform translated. At that time, we didn't have useful tools like Transifex, which enables easy translation. So what we did was just, we put all the strings in a Google Doc, and then we shared it on Twitter and said, are you bilingual? Can you help us translate this? And within less than 48 hours, the whole thing was translated. It was really incredible. And it really shows you the power of inviting um, the global community of volunteers who we cannot make a mistake thinking that volunteers are not experts. Some of the top scientists uh, in New Zealand, some of the top developers, were volunteers when the platform was used to, s to respond to the New Zealand earthquake. So that's also something that is really powerful about the internet. It can bring everyone with different skill levels, but let's not think that volunteers are not experts. Some of them are highly expert. Um, the other thing that um, we learned is this um, question of culture. Uh, how you build and you defend your culture. Does it encourage participation? How does the company culture complement the values that you stand up for? And I'll end the talk with the three non-techie words. How many of you here run companies or organizations? Um, how many of those are technology companies? Now, um, it's often, um, and I'm guilty of this, when describing our organizations, we often go with the technical terms. It's a crowdsourcing platform. It is um, a cloud-based this. It is uh, the Airbnb of, what, of that, or if uh, some technical terms, right? But we must pause and think about the non-technical terms that um, our companies represent? Do our companies represent uh, participation? Do they represent inclusiveness? What sort of things do our companies encourage people to do? Do they encourage people to continue consuming and consuming and consuming? Or do they encourage people to participate? Or do they encourage people... What, what, what value are we bringing in the technology that we're bringing to the table. So the non-technical adjectives that you use to describe your company. Just think about that for a moment. I hadn't thought about that for a really long time because when I used to ta talk about the Ushahidi story or the brick story, I would often talk about the technical part of these things. Or brick can be used for in, um, Internet of Things, it can be used for this, it can be used for that. But let's also think about the values and the non-technical terms of what our software is actually trying to do. At Ushahidi, um, what we did was, <laughs> uh, in terms of culture, uh, one of the things that we realized was not only was the comp company open source, but very diverse. We had people, and we still have people, from different walks of life, um, different locations. And one of the key things that we didn't realize at that time, but I realize now, is that we would often, in our company handbook, it wasn't a normal company handbook, it was filled with insider jokes. Um, but 
we would often say that you need a passport the moment you get into Ushahidi because you will travel here. You will go out and tell the Ushahidi story to others. You will have open source meetups and encourage others to join us to change how information flows and for them to use the software to deal with the problems that they have in their own uh, backyard. So the culture that we tried to uh, have was an openness to the world, and I hope that continues under the new leader. It has continued under the new leadership of Daudi Were and Nat Manning and the other directors of the company. On this question of culture, another very successful company in Kenya called uh, Safaricom, which uh, came up with the M-Pesa mobile money system. Um, and it had tw uh, about 70,000 users in 2007, and right now it has 23 million in 2016, and 42% of Kenya's GDP is transacted via M-Pesa. But when you talk to the CEO of the company, Bob Collymore, he will tell you that the values of the company are about transforming lives. And that became clearer the last few weeks, um, I think it was last month, when um, there was a photograph that was posted on social media of Pauline Shimola, Shamola. And she's a customer service representative in one of the Safaricom stores. And she had knelt down to assist a disabled man who uh, needed some help with his mobile money account. And she didn't know that somebody was taking a picture of this. So she just did her job and went back and then when she went on break, she checked her phone and had, it was blown up. Many messages from her mom who thanked her for the work that she was doing, from many people. And it reminded me that if you have somebody, if, if you have a leader who thinks about these values of transforming lives and embodies that, then the other people who work for the company will find ways to embody that in their daily lives. It's not just... Uh, what are the non-technical terms? What are the non-monetary terms? I've just mentioned the monetary numbers, which are impressive and continue to be impressive. But also this, I also find extremely impressive. She later met with the CEO and they had selfies. But that's another part of the story. So truly this idea of um, values. Another thing, another value that I'd like to share with you today is one of diversity that it's truly the spectrum of our humanity, that it's the richness that can bring to our lives. And we've seen that. I've, I've experienced it with working through Shahidi and also with Brick and other companies. But I urge you to think about that. Um, if nature abhors a vacuum, diversity hates apathy. So figuring out who moves us and how do we move them and how do we move together is really, really important. One of my friends, Adewale Ajadi, talked about this. He writes about this and talks about it and said, it is the greatest force in the world. If you do not use it productively, it will unleash the most destructive consequences. I don't need to tell you about what we've seen the last couple of weeks in America, but Truly, I urge all of us to think about this question of diversity and how we are um, standing up for diversity and because we have seen what not standing up for diversity can do to a country. Um, so just um, some quick stats from um, Africa, which is one of the most diverse continents. Uh, we have 103 million youth uh, worldwide. Um, Actually, uh, we're looking at 54 countries with over 2,000 languages, sparsely populated with harsh conditions, cultural nuances. Um, I find this richness uh, an opportunity and a place to, to figure out the solutions for the next um, advent of the internet, I hope. Um, and on this question of diversity, it's not just about uh, you know, the feel-good kumbaya feeling which you will find. Um, achieving racial and ethnic diversity, according to an Intel report, can help the technology sector generate an additional 300 to $370 billion in revenue annually. 
So advancing diversity in technology is good not only for citizenship, it's good business and good for national and international marketplace. Um, I'll end this section with just three words that I've come to realize about the work at Ushahidi. It was about collaboration, it was about community, and it was about co uh, cooperation. And that the internet can enable all of this. And I dedicate part of this talk to this amazing group of uh, the current Ushahidi staff. And there are many other volunteers who worked together um, to advance the technology that we built then. And it is they have a new platform now. And I'll show you a screenshot at the end. Now, the internet is not without challenges. Vint Cerf, early this year, wrote a paper about internet fragmentation. And he talks about this question of walled gardens and zero rating by companies like Facebook that contravene the values of net neutrality. They contravene the spirit of which the internet was built. And what happens is there may be a generation of people in Africa or other places of the world who will not experience the internet of possibility that we experienced when we got online. Why shouldn't they? We should truly work to make sure that with the connectivity that is happening around Africa and other parts of the world, that it brings together the internet of possibility and not walled gardens where you don't have makers, you just have, have, you just have consumers. That is not the promise of the internet. And the open internet is the air, the water, and the soil of a garden. Um, I'm glad to hear that Peter Sunday is out of Sunday is out of uh, prison, but this is a collective. The internet is yours. It is mine. It is ours. And the heroes and the people who garden on this internet sometimes they get jailed because we society may you know. Uh, to say the least, disagree about what they think should be done on the internet. But I'm reminded by Joy Ito that it truly is that you are the gardeners, you are the producers, you're the people, you're the new industrialists. You're the ones who are going to make the internet better. There are also other challenges when you come to this, the internet of today where you have issues with uh, information overload, filter bubbles, um, fake news, all the recent conversations that have been happening over the last two weeks. Um, and we live in an ecosystem now that the aha moments of how we will solve these problems will not happen just by one individual. It'll happen with us in community with others. It may happen here tonight, today. Um, it may happen later. But the point is, it's in the network. It's in the power of the network that results into um, interesting solutions. There are challenges. There continue to be challenges from my where I currently live and where I'm based at, based out of. Um, there are 70% of Africa is still not connected. What happens when we connect the unconnected on the edges of society? What happens when children are provided with equitable access to knowledge? These are questions that are yet to be answered. But one important question that I would like to keep in mind is how we can give that 70% of unconnected people the internet of possibility and not a, a narrow view of the internet. This is where the work with Brick comes in. Brick was, is a hardware and services company. Uh, let me just correct myself right there. The non-technical terms to, to describe Brick are, is a company that uh, creates connect, connection creates possibility uh, through rugged technology for emerging markets. You see what I did there? Hope you can do that for your companies too. You can think about non-technical terms to describe your companies and the values you stand for. And in the face of power blackouts, we wanted to create technology that would enable people to, uh, to, to stay connected. 
And a few years later, we also created some technology for education and some uh, technology for the Internet of Things that helps with smart farming uh, and enables uh, people to be able to instrument and to, 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 con uh, to control their greenhouses through mobile phones. At BRIC, we truly understand the challenges of digital education in Africa. Just having devices of getting connectivity won't solve the education gap. We have to look at the bigger picture of delivering a sustainable platform for education. So we took what we had learned from working with Kenyan schools. We took the rugged products that we have been building at BRIC and we put them together into the first fully integrated education platform designed in Africa for Africa we introduce the Kio Kit. The Kio Kit combines the connectivity of the brick, the server and content capacity of the brick pie, and 40 of our Africanized Kio tablets into a simple integrated platform that instantly turns any school room into a digital classroom. The entire solution fits into a secure, rugged, and weather-resistant case. To keep the setup simple, the Kio Kit only has one cable, it's power core. Because the classroom experience is so important to us, we designed the entire platform to be turned on and off from a single button. The Kio Kit revolutionizes the very idea of having technology in the African classroom. We don't just think about these ideas in our Nairobi lab. We spend a lot of time in classrooms across Kenya, observing, experimenting, and getting valuable feedback from both the teachers and the students. One lesson we learned from our earlier design iterations is that the tablet charging connection is the greatest single point of failure for devices used by children. So we engineered the Kio not to require cable for charging. The Kio kit includes the fast practical use of wireless charging for education tablets, where the student simply drops their Kio into the kit and it begins charging. Another thing we observed in the classrooms was the teacher's challenge in describing how to put on the headphones correctly. So we color coordinated the earpieces to make giving instructions even easier. A common issue faced by schools in Africa is power interruptions. Once charged, the cues on the entire kit can run through a typical eight-hour school day. In off-grid environments, you can even run the entire system using solar. The Kio Kit stores all the educational content on it so that you don't need to be connected to the internet or power for it to work. This means a school child in Trukana can get the same access to learning as a child in Nairobi. Break is committed to leveling the education playing field in Africa. The Kio Kit is what happens when Africans design a solution for African schools. Now this is my hope, that we can create a digital survival guide for the 21st century. What if we could educate current and future generations on what the internet is? Its ethos, its culture, its rich history. What if we included internet and web literacy as a key part of educational access for the developing markets? Um, this is something that I I'm currently working on uh, in conjunction with Eric and the team at BRIC. Um, and we hope that in time that we can share the idea or in the, the internet of possibility with future generations. And it's not just for young people. Uh, we can also extend these connectivity uh, uh, solutions for older women in, on the edges of society, places that are forgotten, places that are not reached by resources. We can share the, the story of the internet and also hear about how they, their lives can be transformed um, with connectivity and collaboration, hopefully, and cooperation with others. Last but not least, um, I leave you with this question. Who do you serve and how well do you understand them?
what tools are you using to listen to, uh, be it your customers, be it your community, be it people on the ground. This idea of bottom-up flow of information seems to be um, very, very important for us. And as we uh, find ways to be empathic to others that we do not understand, we must first listen and we must first understand. Um, and that in the business er arena can be about what is your local market, who are your customers, but also in the open source technology space or even in the technology space, who is your community? How do they move you and how do you move them? But the most important question is who do you serve? So we've gone full circle. Um, these three words um, came about uh, as I was thinking through not only Ushahidi but also Brick, this idea of connection, opportunity, and possibility. And I was reminded that we have come full circle. Just a few weeks ago, I was volunteering with the Ushahidi team um, for the election in the US, and the work continues under Nathaniel Manning and Daudi Were. It continues to be a diverse global team that exemplifies collaboration, cooperation, and community. And then I thought about it. You know what? It was built into the internet the whole time. So what is your story going to be? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please stay up for a while. <coughs> wow, that is really a positive picture and very heartbreaking in many senses, warming my heart, that is. Um, so I was thinking, being a, I'm, my daily work is as an information security officer, so being a gardener, I'm also afraid of uh, the spread of the weed, the littering of the commons. So what are your thoughts about that? Um, it's, it's absolutely, uh, we need all kinds of talents. Uh, uh, to, to come into the space. So, uh, of course, when it comes to um, the problems in the garden of the internet, uh, we need all kinds of skills uh, to come to bear, to, to really see the possibility and to, to cultivate a culture, a positive culture um, of the internet so that it's an inclusive place where people feel uh, uh, safe to... to, uh, to to be on the internet. There's some scary stuff with bullying and um, just horrendous things uh, against people of color, uh, against people. It, it's been really heartbreaking, um, but we can build better. Um, in processing some of these questions, I think the challenge comes back down to us. Can we build better? Can we build systems that encourage the better part of of our humanity, um, I think, um, yeah, yeah. Not can we build away. better? Yeah, can we build so, better? And with people right. like you, I think that would be possible. Thank you very much. Mons? Yes. I would like to introduce uh, this year's gift to the speakers. Oh. <laughs> we are, uh, from the Internet Foundation, are working hard with including children in the future of the Internet. And as towards that goal, we are letting children build their own robots oh, wow. uh, to learn about technology. And in conjunction with that, we also teach children how to program. Oh, and this wow. robot is a special version of the robot that children can build. And we hope that we'll, uh, it will brighten your day in the future from Internet Thank Blogging. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.